This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. This is the BBC. Thanks for downloading this episode of In Our Time. There's a reading list to go with it on our website, and you can get news about our programmes if you follow us on Twitter at BBC In Our Time. I hope you enjoyed the programmes. Hello, Alexander Pushkin, born in 1799, is seen as the Shakespeare of Russian literature and his novel in verse, Eugene Onegin, as his masterpiece. It's the story of Onegin, a disillusioned fop, of Tatiana, who loves him but is not loved in return, and the young poet Olensky, Onegin's friend. Onegin kills Lensky in a duel, and when Onegin eventually falls in love with Tatiana, it's too late. She has married someone else. Pushkin wrote this verse novel over almost eight years, while exiled, mostly while exiled within the Russian Empire, serialising it and then publishing it whole in St. Petersburg in 1833, just four years before he too was killed in a duel one morning in 1837. His reputation grew under the Tsars and reached the stratosphere in Soviet Russia, where he became the national poet. With me to discuss Pushkin's Eugene Onegin are Andrew Kahn, Professor of Russian Literature at the University of Oxford and Fellow of St. Edmund Hall, Emily Finer, lecturer in Russian and comparative literature at the University of St Andrews, and Simon Dixon, the Sir Bernard Pears Professor of Russian History at University College London. Simon Dixon, can you give us some context about the Russian world into which uh, Pushkin was born? Well, yes. Uh, it, the big question for Russia in, in Pushkin's lifetime was how could an autocratic monarchy cope with the challenge posed by the French Revolution? In other words, how do Tsars, who in theory have no uh, restriction on their power, cope with a world in which uh, multinational empires are threatened by nation states and in which uh, a whole series of new radical democratic and liberal ideas come up? And you can think of that in two ways, I think. At one level, of course, it's an international challenge and the big challenge at the beginning of Pushkin's lifetime comes from Napoleon, who came to power in France in the same year Pushkin was born, 1799. And initially, Napoleon seems unstoppable. He defeated the Austrians. He defeated the Prussians, he invaded Spain. Only comes a cropper when he invaded Russia in the summer of 1812. And there he uh, began to meet his nemesis, partly because he was overstretched, but primarily because uh, the Russians had a way of dealing with him. They had a plan to defeat him. They pushed him out of Russia, and they followed him all the way across uh, Europe to northern France. So that by 1815, uh, Congress of Vienna, Russia is the dominant power in Europe. And that had implications for the internal situation in Russia. Because Tsar Alexander I had won. He defeated Napoleon. So the impetus for reform was relatively small. Uh, so all the Russian officers who came back from Europe, rather keen to see the social and political regime in Russia uh, relaxed a little bit, simply couldn't, uh, couldn't succeed. They couldn't make it. Right, let's zoom in on Pushkin. He's born uh, in 1799. He, as a boy, sees this war. He sees this great victory over Napoleon, whom he continues to idolise. We might come to that later. Uh, and can you tell us about the social structure? We put him in at the bottom of the aristocratic rung, but rung, but still n- an aristocrat. Yes, Pushkin o- o- occupied a rather distinctive uh, place in the Russian social structure. I mean, you can see that in a number of ways. First of all, is obviously his family uh, lineage, because on his mother's side, his great uh, grandfather was an African slave who'd come to Russia at the beginning of the 18th century through the Ottoman slave trade, been taken up by the reigning czar at the time, Peter the Great, who was very uh, fond of the exotic, and he'd gone on to become a great uh, general. So by 1800, of course, the, the Hannibals, as they were called, he took the name Hannibal because of his military prowess, uh, had been assimilated into uh, the Russian aristocracy, but nevertheless they were uh, still exotic and Pushkin was interested in that. He wrote, tried to write a book about it, The Blackamoor of Peter the Great. On the father's side... Pushkins like to claim they went back to the year dot, but they were actually really quite modest uh, Muscovite uh, boyars, traceable to the 15th century. And Pushkin's worry was that people like his family had been somehow uh, usurped, somehow pushed into the background by a whole bunch of new service nobles who'd grown up in the 18th century to staff the, uh, the Russian government. But nevertheless, as, a, as part of the aristocratic structure, 
He got a, a very good education, well, good for the time, languages particularly. He got a sinecure, really, in the civil service. He thought of himself as an aristocrat. They had estates, dilapidated though they were, and somebody swilling around, not enough as it ever was. So he's part of that group in that way. Oh, absolutely. And, in fact, he had an astonishing education because he was one of the first 30 boys to be admitted to the new lycée at sars the new school set up in 1811. Uh, to provide a sort of elite group of uh, state officials. And many of the other boys in that group went on to become ministers under Nicholas I. And they all stayed very much as a group. They were bonded together. They had regular reunions on the date of the foundation of the school, which was the 19th of October. And that was a big date for Pushkin. He wrote several poems connected with that on the dates of the reunion. So he was very much part of this top group. And as a result, came into contact with the Tsars in person. And... Andrew Kahn, he also came into contact with people from the aristocracy like himself and from the military who bubbled up in the 1820s uh, when he was in his mid-twenties into radical groups um, because as was, was, was outlined by, as has just been outlined, the, the idea of, of a Tsar was contested and these radical groups um, burgeoned and he was part of them in what way? Well, I think uh, if one looks a little bit more at his education, Simon Dixon has already talked about the, the lycée. Quite a few of the teachers at the lycée were more reform-minded than one might have expected. Uh, a particularly important figure is a constitutional lawyer named uh, Kunitsin, who knows all about revolutionary theory, uh, lectured to Pushkin and his contemporaries on the reform of serfdom, uh, and was really in the vanguard, uh, wrote a book which is informed by Kant. So actually Pushkin's generation, looking, looking ahead, uh, has a certain number of progressive ideas which they were hoping to see implemented, and those aspirations for reform were dashed. Uh, after Pushkin finished school, uh, in, he moved to St. Petersburg because he took up the sinecure in the Foreign Office, and he found himself in an environment in which some of these people were joining literary societies, which were, let's say, on the left. They had uh, liberal ideas. They were, for the most part, not Republican. For the most part, they were not in favour of regicide. But it's very, very hard to separate out in groups like the Green Lamp um, or the Society of Salvation. It's very hard to separate out the kind of literary progressiveness and the political progressiveness. He's already writing poetry. He publishes his first successful poem when he's 21. He can be fa fairly reasonably called a prodigy and he'll be regarded by that by his contemporaries. And he wrote poems which were thought to be very uh, dodgy at the time. Yeah. Sorry to use a, a low-class word like that, but still, uh, in terms of the Tsar's position, uh, an ode to freedom, for instance. Yes. So the ode to freedom is really a landmark. Uh, Pushkin never acknowledged... Uh, uh, his authorship, uh, it said there's lot, there are lots of anecdotes about the composition. It said that he he wrote it looking at the Mich Mikhailovsky Palace where Paul I, the son, um, the son of Catherine the Great, was assassinated. He wrote it in the flat of a liberal-minded political economist named Turgenev, and it's a work which essentially holds up a warning sign to kings and says, if you don't govern uh, in accordance with natural law, you will meet the fate of Paul I. And in its very last stanza, describes um, the murder of Paul I. Uh, this poem circulated in manuscripts. The authorities knew about it. A particularly nasty spy named um, Karazin uh, denounced Pushkin as a brat to the Governor-General of St. Petersburg. That, that must have hurt. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the prodigious, uh, the gifted Pushkin, found himself um, on Alexander I's uh, hit list, as it were, and he was sent in to what we call exile, although in technical terms he was transferred. He was transferred to the south of Russia. Was it then he was transferred to Crimea for, yes. four, for four years? Yes, Russia? he was transferred to Crimea. He started out in Yekaterinoslav and then spent three years in Kishinev and one year in Odessa, and he had a hell of a time. A hell of a good time. Yeah. He had a hell of a good time, but he also mixed with... Now, what are you talking about? We've got to define that. He, he is a <laughs> dissipated... We can't just say a hell of a good time. It wasn't at Funfest, was it? So uh, what was he doing? No. Well, uh, he was joining things like um, a Masonic Lodge, 
called... Um, that doesn't it. sound like a good time. Well, I think in those days this was a place for uh, liberal-minded people to meet. He was hobnobbing with, uh, well, a former girlfriend of Byron's. He was writing lots of poetry, including a blasphemous poem uh, called the Gabrieliad, in which the Archangel Gabriel um, has uh, a bit of hanky-panky with the Virgin Mary. He was not relenting in his, um, in his descent and his commitment to... Uh, writing what he wanted. But this is important for the poem itself. Was he, as we just dis- <coughs> coming during the poem, was he dissolute, was he gambler, was he rolling up debts, was he a superfluous man? Uh, well, I, th- I don't think he was superfluous. He had a purpose in life, which was to make sure that his poems, uh, as you said, he had a great success in 1820 with a rollicking narrative poem called Ruslan and Ludmila. He had a, and Ludmila, he had a readership. But uh, he was meeting with radicals. He met an English atheist he doesn't name, a materialist, uh, which suggests that uh, he, at the time, um, had lost all faith uh, entirely. And his liberal principles were developing, and he wrote poems which were disseminated amongst radical groups. So exile, I mean, finally consists of not being allowed to St. Petersburg. Otherwise, he seems to be fairly unrestrained. I think that's right, and I think that even though I wouldn't call him a superfluous man, being sent so far away from the centre of life... No, I was using the phrase you used just to get move on. My fault, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he, was so, um, he was so far away from St Petersburg that he probably felt superfluous in that sense. <laughs> <laughs> so what, can we give some idea, he is a poet, he reads a lot, what was he, how Byron's been mentioned, how influenced was he by Byron? I think he was very influenced by Byron. By the time he wrote Yevgeny Onegin, Byron was really an old influence, I think you could say. He'd got over Byron by then. He didn't want to be an egotistical romantic. He wanted to also be funny. But Byron was phenomenally successful and influenced a great number of young writers. And uh, Pushkin did take up a form that was like the Byron form, like the form in Child Harold. So he was still, he was there, even if a bit of a background. What else was he reading? I think that's absolutely right. But he, I, um, from my point of view, it's very interesting that he read Tristram Shandy by Lawrence Stern. Again, a very loose novel that is a novel about writing a novel. Um, Stern was important to him. Shakespeare was also important to him. We don't think that he read either of those uh, authors in English. In fact, he read them in French. Um, He was interested in learning English, but it doesn't look like he had much success until the end of the uh, the 1820s. And so he, he can't have just read... What else was he reading? What else was he reading? I mean, Rousseau. usually you know, he actually studied with references. He, he, Rousseau, yes? Rousseau, Hume. He was um, not reading but listening to folk tales, um, usually thought to be told by his old nurse when he was in exile in Mikhailovskaya. In his country estate. Was there much Russian that he was reading? There's somebody said in one of your notes that, that um, uh, we write love letters in French, we, work, we go to work in German and we talk to our servants in Russian. I think it's that we shout at our servants Shout at in our Russian. servants, yes. Well corrected, yes. <laughs> yes, I think that's right. I mean, people like to say that Pushkin started Russian literature. I'm not sure that's really true. There was an awful lot of literature in Russian, prose in Russian, and of course poetry in Russian before Pushkin. There was a lot of translation as well into Russian before then. So someone like Stern had been translated twice by the time Pushkin came to read him. I think Pushkin still read him in French, but he was available in Russian. I'm very briefly sketched out the plot of Pinyagin. Could you develop that? Yes, of course. Um, So the way the novel begins, we have a day, or rather a night, in the life of a young dandy in St. Petersburg society, going to the opera, the ballet, etc. This young man... Yevgeny um, inherits property. His uncle dies. He wasn't very fond of his uncle, um, but he gets the chance to go cynical to about having to look after him, more or less saying, will you hurry up and die so I can get my hands on the money? Which is an interesting way to start a poem. Yes. Um, or a novel, indeed. Um, he's not portrayed as uh, the most likable character um, right from the beginning, I think. Um, once he's in the countryside, he's extremely bored. He was also bored in high society in St. Petersburg, um, but in the countryside, he he seems to appreciate his surroundings to some extent, but he makes friends with a local family. He meets Lensky, a returned student from Germany, who's a romantic poet. He meets the local family who have two daughters. One is Olga, 
She's not very interesting. One is Tatiana, who really attracts both Anyegin and the narrator of the whole novel. Tatiana falls in love with Anyegin um, almost immediately, but we don't have any information about their first meeting. Uh, she writes him a letter. He then rejects her in the garden. He um, gives her a kind of sermon, in a sense. Then um, we have a duel. There's a party, and at the party, um, Anyegin re- dances with the wrong person, with Olga, who's actually Lensky's betrothed. And um, Lensky, I suppose, um, well, Lensky is very romantic, so he Lensky's thinks that Lensky's his young friend whom he's met, he's taken up. Uh, Lensky, he, 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 they, they become friends, they say, through boredom, because they're the only two interesting people yes. in, this, in, in this part of the country. That's right. Uh, and he's a younger man. Uh, and he's killed in this duel. Yes. And, he's and killed then, in the duel by Onyegin. That's right. And then Onyegin is away. And he comes back to find Tatiana married. Married in high society, presiding over a ball and a salon, um, beautiful, stately, uh, refined, and he falls in love with her. He writes her a letter. In fact, he writes her several letters. And then she rejects him in a beautifully phrased rejection um and then the novel breaks off yes it yes. doesn't really end yes well, thank you very much for that it's probably you had to sort of race through it but uh, <laughs> i think the listeners are now fully informed they've got all they need to know to know what we're going to, going to talk about next you're getting a thumbs up around the tables simon dixon would he would in would in Jägen in the verse novel it's in stanzas there are over 300 stanzas um, uh, would he have been a recognisable character type in Russia at that time? Well, certainly lots of features of his character would have been very recognisable. Yeah. Uh, Emily says that he's introduced in this first canto of, of the novel uh, and he's subjected to some wonderfully satirical treatment and it sounds a bit like the sort of school report that uh, Pushkin would have had at, at the Lycée. You know, he's a clever chap but uh, a bit superficial, not very profound, doesn't work very hard. And the symbol of all that is the French language. He's very good at French, but it's a symbol of sort of fecklessness and affectation in his case, and superficiality in everything. This is a man who's, he's off with the latest fashion, whatever it might be. If it's sartorial, he's a dandy. If it's intellectual, he's interested in the sort of political economy that uh, Andrew talked about. He's read Adam Smith, for example, though of course he hasn't digested it all. So all this is a sort of sense of a a superficial person who can't quite grasp anything. And that takes you on to what you mentioned earlier on about the the gambling, you know. He's a card player. He spends a lot of time at balls and and, uh, dances and when when he's not doing that he's playing cards now cards it's it's a symbol of sociability it's very nice to join in but of course it's a great symbol of boredom boredom you've mentioned a couple of times big theme in this uh, his attention span is very very short isn't yes. it I, he, yes. he's, by the time he's 25 he's bored stiff of everything in st yeah. petersburg after three days in the country when he's he's, yeah. he's got his, his his uncle's estate the poor old chap having dropped dead he uh, he's bored with three days first day's okay second day's a That's bit it. of a worry third days had it the boredom is it's it's a, a sign of social stagnation really it's, it's a sign of the sort of thing we were talking about earlier on you can't actually do anything in russia you've got a strong sense of self-worth you've got a strong sense that you want to do something but this isn't the sort of society in which you can fulfill yourself Emily so was, you might as well just play cards sorry, sorry. yeah pushkin is <laughs> there are other options Come on. <laughs> anyway, Emily. pushkin is insistent that um Anyagin is a bad reader he reads but he's not really thinking about what he reads yeah. he doesn't understand it and that's very important in this novel because Tatiana on the other hand is what we might call a good reader she gets involved in what she reads she gets passionate about what she reads and she processes it so that everybody in this novel is defined by the way they read Andrew Andrew Khan there's the narrator figure there who's uh, playful elusive can you tell the listeners more about the narrator well, and, and he plays a part. Plays he, a does, part. he plays a big part, and in fact, in the course of the novel, uh, he counterbalances Tatiana as Onyegin fades from view, particularly after the duel. And as Emily has already said, Lawrence Stern, with his gift for digression, is one important influence uh, on the, the form of Onyegin, a novel in verse which has missing stanzas uh, and loops back in time. Uh, the narrator is clearly a proxy for Pushkin. Uh, there's a famous uh, frontispiece, an engraving that shows Pushkin, recognizably, recognizably Pushkin, on the bank of the Neva standing next to Anyegin. So it's quite clear that, uh, and Pushkin actually in chapter one, in counter one, says, don't confuse me with Byron. I don't equate myself with, you know, my hero, 
unlike Byron, who suffers from that limitation. However, the narrator, who's chatty, who's very literary, who's playful, uh, who was a friend of Onegin's, he makes it clear, he really, and has certain things in common with Pushkin. For instance, he talks about his nanny. Uh, well, Pushkin liked to hear these folk tales from his nanny, and that was well known. So there's a great overlap between Pushkin's biography, and the reader can see this, particularly at the beginning of Chapter 8, where the narrator talks about his youth in the, the Lycée. And I think for all readers, you didn't require special insider knowledge to know, to recognise that. Folk, as, uh, for the folk uh, area has been mentioned once or twice, and he deliberately puts in, there are folk stories introduced, uh, the young women singing in the field, singing songs they don't want the men to hear, or they do but they don't, that sort of thing. And he, he puts it in very deliberately. Why do you think he does that, Emily? I think it makes a great novel. I think that he doesn't want to write just a society tale. He doesn't want to write another version of Child Harold. He wants to write something Russian, whatever that means. Um, so when Tatiana is in love and has been rejected, she turns to divination. She looks at fortune-telling. And then the novel produces a wonderful dream for her, which she tries to interpret. What are we to make of her letter before we get to the dream, which is one of the best songs in the Tchaikovsky um, melodies, how we say, in the Tchaikovsky opera? The letter is very interesting. Push, uh, Pushkin, using the narrator, frames it for many stanzas. He tells us about it's going to be written like this. It's Actually, of course, she would have written it in French, so I'm going to translate it. So before we ever get there, we've heard an awful lot about this letter. Um, when we actually read it, it's the first time that stanza form, that persistent stanza form, has been broken. So it's, um, it's not divided into sonnets, if you like. The letter itself is a love letter, certainly, but it's not clear really from the letter whether Tatiana is expecting some kind of outcome. It's very open-ended. Um, she wishes that she hadn't ever met him, I think, and um, she really, she's, it's a passionate letter, but she, it's not quite clear what she's asking for. I also, when I read that letter, I'm not particularly sure she's writing it to Onyegin. I think oh, she's well, writing it to herself. Really? <laughs> I mean, I know it's wonderful, isn't it, to academics, but actually, never mind. Yes, I'm, I, I thought she was writing it to him, and I thought she was passionately in love with him. And the, pre the stanzas before that, he says, he says she was breathless, she could think of nothing else, she couldn't sleep. She, uh, he just, I thought he describes wonderfully the obsession that, that sort of, teen maybe we can't call them teenagers, not sure, the young, the youthful, obsession with being overwhelmed by love. And she, it was for Onyegin, uh, not for anybody else. And I didn't think particularly for herself, uh, uh, but never mind, I could be completely wrong. I mean, one way of thinking about the letter, just drawing on something Emily said, is that although it seems like an outpouring of naive emotion, absolutely passionate, and she is seducing him, uh, she is really writing a letter of seduction in the manner of... Um, you know, one of Richardson's heroes. But um, when you look closely at the text... Yes, they're influenced you, you see by the English lots, novel in that sense. Yes, they? very closely Clarissa, English novel. Yes. Lots of allusions to her reading, uh, the, the novels of Rousseau, for instance. So um, the connection between life and the feeling a character can have, but also what they've been reading, is very close to the surface there. And she is performing passion in that sense. But I think she's also expressing it. Am I oh, a yes. tree, or is this not a letter about love, about love for somebody? It's Emily, come it's, back. It's a letter about love, but how does she know how to write a love letter like this? Well, she well, you knows don't have to know how to write novels. a love letter. You just have to know how to write. <laughs> and then you say you're in love with somebody, you write anything that comes into your head, and because it's about love, this is a love letter. No? Yeah, yeah that's convincing. <laughs> Andrew, yeah. Well, by contrast, um, if you look at Onyegin's rejection, so in the next chapter he appears and tells her, thank you very much, I appreciated your sentiments, but I couldn't possibly return them. Uh, it's very, very interesting that um, those stanzas, which are incorporated by Tchaikovsky in the opera, uh, verbatim, they're not literary at all. They're very blunt, they're not novelistic, they're a, a very frank and, and candid statement that owe hardly anything at all to literature. So there's a juxtaposition there between her imagination, which is also fully alive in the dream, that great dream, and, and his woodenness. Can we come to the idea of Russia? 
Tatyana, if we can, can we contextualize in the sense of Russia at the time? Tatyana became, in the Soviet era and late 90s, the great mother Russia, not mother, but the great valiant mother Russia figure. After his, I think on Yegin's rejection of poetry, what a cad, I think it was reasonably honourable. Out of the blue comes this torrent of affection and torrent of demand in a way, and he, he meets her immediately the next day in the garden and says, I'm very sorry, I don't feel like this for you. And just because you feel like this for me doesn't mean that I've got to feel like this for you. What do you think? Well, you're quite right. Of course, Dostoevsky, no less, thought that uh, Tatiana was quintessentially Russian. And, and it, it, we're told in the poem she doesn't quite know why, but she has this very close affinity with the landscape, with the environment, with the climate, everything she is integral to, to, to Russia. Uh, and, uh, of course, there's this sort of mor moral involvement that we'll, we'll get to in talking about her, her love relationship with Anyagin. But um, it's a bit more complicated than that because she actually, of course speaks and reads in French. We're told that she resists Russian, like a lot of ladies, Pushkin says. And the more we learn about uh, Russia at the time, that certainly seems to be true. There seems to be absolutely no contradiction, even in an era of romantic nationalism, between uh, patriotism and uh, Russianness and speaking in French. In this case, French isn't to do with affectation or, or fecklessness at all. It's to do with that. And there's a reason for that, and that is that in this period, in order to be Russian... Uh, you have to be a citizen of the wider world. You have to have this involvement with, with the, the big cosmopolitan world as a whole. And the, the, the reason why Evgeny Onegin was immediately received as a very important piece of literature by Belinsky, for example, a great Russian critic, was that here somehow Pushkin had managed to synthesize the sort of folk elements and the, the superstitious stuff that we've been talking about with the greater literary tradition. And he managed to synthesize them in, uh, uh, together, just as Glinka would later do in his opera Life for the Tsar. Andrew, can you just tie up any loose ends about the, the, the similarities between Pushkin's life and the life he gives to Onyegin? Well, I think actually the differences are perhaps uh, more revealing than the similarities. Yes, they're both aristocratic. Yes, they both are, are landed gentry. Uh, both are well-read. Uh, as Simon said, uh, Pushkin's school report would perhaps not have been the most glowing. Uh, but Pushkin is not, unlike the narrator, the narrator has a famous um, fascination or fetish for feet. Uh, so far as we know, Pushkin, who was a ladies' man, uh, did not uh, sh share that, that particular um, erotic taste. Uh, unlike Onyegin, uh, he, you know, wasn't wooden, was very charming, quite seductive. Uh, their reading is similar, but Onyegin says... Uh, or rather the narrator says of Onyegin, he doesn't like poetry. And that's meant to suggest his commitment perhaps to political thought rather than to poetry. And so uh, there's a, dis a gap between Pushkin and uh, his hero. And similarly, there, as I said, there's a greater sort of overlap or co co coincidence between the narrator and Pushkin. And the, the duel, so, of Sorry. Course. Well, and because, yes, they, the duel idea, and he is killed in a duel yes. at the end, and the, he is he's involved in more than one duel, isn't he? Uh, and Pushkin, yet, you know, Pushkin is, it is said that uh, he was involved in 29 duels of one kind or another. Wow. Lucky yeah. tw unlucky 29, then, was it? Unlucky 29, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I must remember that. But, so they share that kind of sense of honour as an aristocratic yes, yes. Uh, value. Yes. And it's, it's illegal, though, isn't it? And so they're yes. taking that sort of risk. They're against the regime by doing it in the first place. Yes, and Pushkin is a gambler as well. We'd already talked about gambling, boredom. Uh, but a duel is illegal, and it, there is a great risk involved. Emily, once or twice we re we've referred to um, the episode in which Tatiana has a dr Tatiana has a dream. Could you describe that? Yeah, this happens at the very centre of the novel, and it really looks back and it looks forwards, so like kind of mirror. Um, in the dream, Tatiana is running away from something. She's running through the snow. It's winter. Wonderful descriptions of snow um, and the Russian countryside there. She tries to cross a river. She doesn't manage. Um, and suddenly a bear appears and helps her across. Uh, the bear carries her to a little hut in the forest. And this hut is full of a kind of noisy, raucous dinner party full of bizarre monsters, um, sort of parts of different animals joined together. And presiding over this table is Anyegin. When they notice Tatiana peeping in at the door, they all shout, she's mine, she's mine. But Anyegin replies, no, she's mine, and rescues her from this assembly 
Um, then suddenly, when she's outside on a bench, um, and Olga appears, and so does Lensky. And suddenly there is a sharp knife, <laughs> and we assume that Anyegin kills Lensky, which of course prefigures what is about to happen, not in the dream, but in the basic story. Is this, it's an extraordinary passage, isn't it? Uh, is this something taken from a folk tale, or is this, as far as we know, completely invented? I think there are lots of elements of folk tales, um, huts in the forest, this kind of thing. Being carried th off by a bear. Being carried off by a bear. Um, it's also a running away dream, I suppose you could say, but it, I think that it's different bits and pieces of folk tales all stuck together. Andrew, you want to come in? Well, just to say that, I mean, Pushkin had an ample collection of divination books. Uh, there's a, a famous German book, which was you know, known to be in his library. One of these divination books has a, a motto saying, if you see a bear, you marry. So clearly the, there's a, a grotesque parody here of a marriage ritual, a funeral, but also her anxiety about having, not having married Onyegin, but she's on the brink of going to Moscow. Uh, to be married off, and she knows that. So anxiety is part of it. And what's Tatiana's reaction to this dream? She immediately gets a book from under her pillow that is a book on how to interpret your dream. And she finds no success. <laughs> it doesn't work. Who had written this, uh, How to Interpret Your Dream, book? Martin Zedeker. Um, Was it any good? Not for her. <laughs> <laughs> um, the... Let's talk about the duel for a moment. Can you say, give that a bit of context, Simon? Yes, well, as, as you say, it was it, dueling was illegal, uh, but it was adopted by the Russian nobility for a very straightforward reason. They were, they were quite anxious that their corporate privileges and that their personal autonomy simply couldn't be preserved by the state. The state uh, behaved in an arbitrary way towards them. In theory, Catherine the Great's charter to the nobility had exempted the nobility from corporal punishment, but then her son was quite happy, Tsar Paul, to lash about with his cane and sort of beat people up and there were all sorts of stories of unauthorised floggings and so on so this was a very hierarchical and arbitrary system of violence by comparison with the duel which as Andrew says is based on a sort of aristocratic system of honour and so it was a, that, that was the, the, the way of escaping uh, arbitrary, arbitrariness uh, I mean the difficulty of course is it's very easy to develop a kind of idealised picture of a duel in which everybody's a perfect gentleman and uh, it all works according to plan and uh, it's quite clear that it didn't always work like that and we can see that in, in the case of this duel between Anyegin and Lyansky where Anyegin turns up late and he brings, a, he brings a second who is a commoner rather than a nobleman there are all sorts of breaches to, to the code what we've missed out, and if you could help us by, being, by telling us and being <coughs> reasonably brief about it, are the Decembrists, the radical move against the Tsar in the mid-1820s, of which Pushkin was but kind of wasn't public, but he was still branded with it, and, and how radical were they? Can you just give us a fix on that? Because yeah. it's important for his reputation later uh, and then. Yes, no, it's very important indeed. Uh, when Pushkin was in the south, uh, particularly in Kishinev and Odessa, he met a number of people who were involved in a conspiracy. Some of them, two of them in particular, were picked up, uh, and Alexander I and, and his um, security services, as it were, were sort of on the alert. But there was a northern society as well, and the northern society continued to meet in secret. Uh, and in 1825, on the 14th of December, at the coronation, of Nicholas I, there was an attempt to mount a putsch. Pushkin at this point, uh, as Emily's already said, was on the family estate, a ramshackle place in Mikhailovska, very, very far away. He did not know about the plot, and although he'd sniffed out various conspiracies, really from 1817 was aware that things were afoot, uh, he'd never really been trusted uh, for one reason or another with any what secret was, information. One reason will do. Why hadn't he been trusted? Too childlike, too much a poet. Too uh, loquacious. Too, and too loquacious, uh, and too likely to blow the people's cover. Uh, so um, he was actually not in St. Petersburg when this happened. He was summoned back uh, in um, 18, the summer of 18, the autumn of 1826 by Nicholas I, the new Tsar, and pardoned. But this was after five of the Decembers had been hanged. 
And as Simon said, uh, really from the mid-18th century, corporal punishment had been abolished for the nobility. So their execution and the exile of over 100, 120, I think, members of the gentry was quite a shocking historical moment. And Pushkin found himself positioning himself between the expression of sympathy for um, members of his own class and people he admired and trying to accommodate the Tsar who had made himself his personal, the poet's personal censor. So he was kind of caught in a double bind there. Yes, he was playing both ends against the middle, wasn't it? I mean, you can't, you can't blame him. He wanted to survive, which is fair enough. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. He was in an impossible position, made worse as time went on, because Nicholas I became Pushkin's personal creditor. His gambling, gambling debts continued to mount. Uh, his publications were not commercially successful for the, the most part. The marriage didn't work very well. The marriage didn't work very well. We had a, a gambler and a spendthrift uh, shack up, and Nicholas I all too readily advanced credit. Uh, and Pushkin was publishing less and less in the 1830s. Emily... When we get to the second part, as it were, uh, he fall, she falls in love with him and he rejects her. He comes back, sees her in great style, uh, holding a salon, a sub very substantial person. He falls in love with her and she rejects him. Can you talk about that? Yes. <laughs> yes, I mean, Tatiana really reveals the symmetry of the novel in her response. She refers back to what she said to him, if you like throwing it back in his face, I suppose you could say. But she is... Um, she's not the emotional person that she once was. Her thoughts are well-formed, organised, um, and she rejects Anyagin because she is married, ultimately. And that's the end of it. She does say that she loved him, even that she still loves him. She also shows a kind of nostalgia for the old days. She remembers her old bookshelf and the garden um, where she used to live before she became a princess, if you like, in, in uh, St. Petersburg. Um, but really, the two letters should be read together because they match each other very nicely. Yeah. And, um, and she became, in her own right, a figure of great regard in Russian, not only in Russian literature, but in, in Russian, that idea of who was a good person, who was a great person in it, that the Russians could look up to. I think that's right. I think morally speaking, she makes the right decision, obviously, and she makes it in a nuanced way. It's, it's important that throughout Anyegin, we hear Tatiana's voice. We get to read her words and we get to hear her words. And um, the narrator really privileges those words. She never just says something. It's always introduced with compassion and empathy. He looks after her very well, doesn't he? He does. Throughout, yes, throughout the novel poem. Uh, Simon, he was dead uh, four years after the uh, publication of, uh, of Aminagin. Um, Andrew has given us to understand that he was on the skids anyway. Uh, do you think he would, uh, would have written more or what? Well, it's very difficult to know, but yeah, uh, he, he, but he could have. He, 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 uh, he, he did manage to write in those four years. Uh, although he wrote less, he wrote two very important works, both about the same event: the uh, Pugachev Revolt of the 1770s, uh, a really marvellous miniaturised history, a uh, great work of scholarship in lots of ways, mm -hmm. alongside a fictionalised treatment, the Captain's Daughter, and the, uh, that ends, of course, in a in Tsarskoye Selo with Catherine virtually on stage. The whole manuscript is dated 19th of October 1836, that magic date for the Lycée. So in many ways, it's kind of business as usual. On the other hand, as Andrew says, debts are mounting up. Uh, it's OK, th he's getting them paid by the Tsar, isn't well, it? Well, no, uh, uh, I'm not sure that that's the case, actually. He's, he, he, he was seriously in trouble. He became more and more depressed, and with depression came bouts of anger, mm -hmm. uh, uncontrollable sort of choleric uh, moments, and these were responsible, I think, for the increasing number of declarations of duels, you know, that he just lost, he lost it, really. Uh, and then his mother died at uh, Easter 1836. So by 1836, when the, you're, you're approaching the final duel with the brother-in-law, uh, Dantes, uh, I think there's a sense that he, he, already members of his group are beginning to die out. He's certainly not the first. He's a sense that it, there's not a great future ahead of him. Andrew, do you want to come in on Well, that? I think that last poem in the 19th October cycle, which talks about our little, our little group, yeah. which shone so beautifully and is now thinning out, uh, is a great meditation on mortality, and it's a universal meditation on mortality. I think he would have continued to, to produce um, 
certainly works of criticism. He's a very active book reviewer, literary critic. Uh, he's very keen to have successes in prose. He's working through... the you know, different prose forms. The, the novel is a genre. He has his uh, very successful historical novel. There are fragments. But also, I think it's important to say that some of his greatest poems were unpublished at his death, and some of them were written, at, you know, in the last years. In, in the Bronze Horseman, which is one of, of course, the great masterpieces, canonical works of Russian literature, was written in 1833. So I think he's still firing on all cylinders, but one can't ignore the depression and the real difficulties he faced. Emily, Emily what, what would you say his impact has been on Russian literature? His impact has been enormous. Uh, every writer I can think of has said something about him, even written something in response to something he wrote. In the Soviet Union, he was obviously very important. There, his reputation as a Decemberist um, was exaggerated greatly. So, uh, so they, they liked him because, he, he, as they thought, he had been a radical. He was a revolutionary, yeah. Yeah, in revolutionary. fact. And had he been alive in the Soviet Union, he would have been a revolutionary. He also created the Russian language, something of, much, uh, of great pride. That's not necessarily true, but that was one of the aspects that were important. He was an innovator of form as well. He created a new type of novel. Um, and then, if you were a dissident, of course, he was cruelly censored by the Tsar. He was repressed. So there was really something for everyone there. And that legacy continues, Simon? Yes, it certainly does. I mean, if you count the statues of Alexander Pushkin in the current Russian Federation, he'd be pretty near the top. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And people still learn him as cool. I don't know. Oh, I, absolutely. Yes, I, he's I, I was talking to someone last Lindor. night who, 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 who learned a lot, still remembered great chunks of Pushkin. Yes. 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 And that legacy, do you think it's, it's a manufactured legacy or, or is it one of the most t ten important works of literature? as has been said by one of you? It's a manufactured legacy which works because it can be sustained from within, because it's real. It's yeah. both. Yeah. Well, I think Pushkin's fortunes, his reputation in Russia, even more than abroad, has been a litmus test of political currents, the attitudes, the ideology of a regime. Uh, in the 1990s, as the Soviet Union fell apart, Pushkin became the star of a punk film, for instance. So he's protean, and in that respect, perhaps Shakespearean. Uh, but I agree entirely with... Um, Simon and Emily in saying that uh, he's, a, he's a wonderful, wonderful writer, but his own biography has been recast to suit other purposes, which does happen. Final word? Um, so, yeah, you, can, you could look at the history of Pushkin through chocolate wrappers. Pushkin is always um, a, a, a good decision to put on to brand your chocolate. Well, there we go. There we go. Thank you very much, Emily. <laughs> Andrew Khan and Simon Dixon. Next week we'll be talking about Plato's Republic and his question, is it always better to be just than unjust? We'll also be talking about exploring ideas of the soul and the value of poetry in society. So there's a bit of a connection there. Thank you very much for listening. And the In Our Time podcast gets some extra time now with a few minutes of bonus material from Melvin and his guests. Sorry to spring the last one on you. But no, you're getting no, perfect. 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 Absolutely perfect, <laughs> isn't it? I've got a vodka label. I've got a vodka label. Can we, are we on? Right, but, you're on. When now. I was uh, picking up on Emily's chocolate wrapper, um, a former student of mine sent me a wonderful vodka label. That, that particular um, that particular distillery <laughs> no longer exists, but it shows Pushkin sipping vodka with his nanny. Um, and the, the brand is, is named for her. Adina Radionovna is the name of the vodka. So... Um, <laughs> There, there was an advert for a computer which showed a girl at a laptop in 1999, the anniversary, and the first lines of the letter, I'm writing to you, what more can I do? And of course, everybody would have recognised that, Tatiana's letter. Yeah. He's not on any cigarettes, is he? There's ours on cigarettes. There's a wonderful branch, of, uh, a picture of Peter the Great, and it says, Piotr, Siegda Pierri. Peter always first, it says. Uh, it's a great, How did, uh, what did Tolstoy uh, think of him? Oh, he adored him. Uh, Tolstoy had great sympathy for lyric poets, mm. uh, although the radicals didn't like Pushkin. Uh, mind you, they didn't like any lyric poets. Pushkin mm. um, admired him as a lyric poet uh, above all. Tolstoy admired him. Uh, Tolstoy admired, right. yes, Tolstoy yeah. admired him greatly. He did indeed, yes. Yeah. We didn't really talk about realism, but I think the idea that Pushkin represents reality in a, in a new way um, really attracted Tolstoy. He notices the details. Mm.
the details of the of the what happened in the fields and uh, what, details and of what happened in the fields. But just yes, he he sees things as if for the first time. You might say. It's, well, for, to take one example, um, so I think someone mentioned the chorus of maids out in the field um, harvesting berries, yeah. uh, and that's an example of the folklorization of the work, but it's also well known that um, landowners ask their um, serfs to sing while um, collecting berries because that meant they couldn't steal them. If they were singing, they couldn't eat them. So that's, you know, you could say that that's folklore. You could also say it's a detail that has but a bit, an that element in, of realism. That's in, that's in the poem. But that's it's in the in, at the end yeah, of yeah, chapter yeah, one. Yeah, exactly, yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. There's quite a lot of detail in the poem about the difficulty of agricultural reform, yes. actually. Mm, that yes. it, it, when when uh, Yevgeny Anyagin arrives at his estate for the first yeah. time, he tries to make life easier for the serfs, and the only result is to irritate the noble landowners nearby. And then first Further on in the poem, you get discussions of other modernizers who merely irritate the peasants. Yes. Serfs didn't always want yes. to be told how to manage yes, as Simon, as si I mean, Simon knows better than I as, as a historian, but I mean, there are two main sy systems of serfdom, and Yevgeny moves his um, peasants onto the quit rent system, which is thought to be a bit more equitable, but it means it's a cash transaction essentially, and landowners didn't like it, they got less work out of the peasantry. But I think it actually keys into something we haven't talked about, which is the genesis of Evgeny, and I don't know whether you're interested yeah, in yeah. the draft versions, but yeah. he's not... I mean, if you look at the total amount of text Pushkin wrote, you see that he had much... He had plans for a more rounded character, someone who was more sympathetic, who had an inner emotional life, who developed, who was much more a partner for Tatiana, um, who wasn't just the kind of Petersburg dandy who dabbles, but actually was, as Emily yeah. said, a reader. And this was paired away after the December's Rebellion. In 1827, 1828, he took some radical steps in pruning away really quite substantial amounts of finished text, which took us into... A, a, you know, Anyagin's world into his library, into his notebooks, mm. into a diary. But, um, and also there are two missing chapters which were dropped. Uh, there's something called, a fragment called Anyagin's Journey, uh, which does exist and which Pushkin published as part of the serialization. And that made it clear that after he murders Lensky, he feels remorse and he goes traveling. There's a chapter 10, which he destroyed because it looks as though it was subversive and it seems as though he was plotting um, to put Anyagin on, on Senate Square on the 14th of December 1825 to radicalise him as it were. And so he pulled out of that? He did. He, 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 he was in a lot of trouble 1827, 1828. The church was up in arms because he published, or rather, a, a blasphemous poem had circulated. The Tsar hauled him in personally and said, that thing you wrote in 1821 about the Virgin Mary, go on, confess. You did it, didn't you? And he had to confess. So, and so he, um, his wings were clipped. Yeah. And it changed, I think, the presentation of the hero, the portrait, greatly. You said a lot of... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> you said a lot of people had written in Russian before him. Yeah. Did he draw on them at all? I think he certainly did. Yeah. I mean, in terms of poetry, there are some fantastic poets before Pushkin, and he was very careful to show his respect for them and his deference yeah. to them in a way that, for example, he doesn't with Byron. He is flippant about Byron in Onyegin. He's not flippant about Zhukovsky, for example. Mm. Van Wiesen. Mm -hmm. Van Wiesen is an interesting example, uh, an 18th century dramatist at court who writes two classic uh, satires uh, and is quite, has quite a political agenda and stands up for the nobility. And there are epigraphs from Van Wiesen and quotations. Mm -hmm. I mean, there'd been a great debate all through the 18th century in, in language terms, yes. hadn't there? How to create a Russian yes. literary language which was both uh, classically uh, justifiable and at the same time would incorporate uh, uh, popular speech and so on. And to, to get the balance was very difficult. And in the 18th century, they didn't manage it. And that's one reason why most of the time one doesn't read the 18th century uh, literature uh, uh, unless you're people like us as it were <laughs> but, but uh, then you know they're not in wide distribution whereas Pushkin for, uh, manages to create this extraordinarily mellifluous uh, literary language it is drawing, one, yeah. it, it's remarkable and so that's one reason why he's very, a Shakespeare also rolled like into one lovely and Dante yeah. 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 and at the same time brevity and precision I mean if yes. you see a column yeah. of uh, Pushkin in Russian, it just this tiny little column runs down the middle of the page, 
mean, yeah. any translation, no matter how brilliant, is always more wordy and yeah. uh, yes. more verbal. Right, is that the right translation that I've got? I've got the yeah. penguin again. Anyway, I can't remember it. I'm glad you asked Stanley, Stanley Mitchell's I was worried for a moment it might have been one of you three, but it... Oh, you're saying me. Charles Johnson, also. Charles Johnson's a famous version, or Stanley Mitchell. There translations of it, I think. People used to always say, oh, it's untranslatable. I think there are 13 translations, and most of them have wonderful... famous one by Nabokov. Yeah, that's the worst. Not the best, is it? No, the worst. The least poetic, I suppose. It's a reference book. He was a pedant, was he? He was. Uccioni Malini pedant. Yes, he was. Pushkin says that of Anyekin. That he's, a, he's a learned man and, and our a producer is going to come and cut you off in your prime no, with a great offer anything from the samovar tea <laughs> 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 okay. another cup of coffee samovar. coffee would be great yes. okay. be and for more podcasts on arts and ideas from the BBC follow the link on our website to the best of BBC Radio 3's free thinking programme